around 600 BC, a slave named Aesop told a fable of a fox who, being hard hunted and having run a long chase, sought refuge from a farmer who told the fox to hide in his barn. Presently, the hunters came up and inquired of the man if he had seen the fox. No, says he, I have not seen him. But all the while, he pointed to the barn so that they would find him. But the hunters failed to take the hint and went on their way. Soon after, the fox made to depart without a word. Indignant, the farmer called after him, Ungrateful fellow, have you not the manners to thank your saviour before you go? But the fox, who had seen all through a chink in the barn, rebuked the man, I assure you, had your actions been agreeable to your words, I should have thanked you. But because they contradicted, I thank you not. The concern the thoughts, words and deeds align is a universal and perennial one. The liar thinks one thing and says another. The hypocrite says one thing and does another. The self-deceived identify as one but are another. All three are untrue to God's law and to their own best selves. Hypocrites, said Jesus, you honour me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Like whitewashed tombs, you are beautiful on the outside, but full of corruption and death within. Take the log out of your own eye before trying to extract a splinter from your brothers. When God commands Israel to love him in today's first reading, he's not trying to win friends and influence people. Loving him is all gain for us, not for him. Nor is he telling us to feel a certain way about him. After all, we can't easily command our feelings. No, the love God demands of Israel today is an act of the will, chosen and lived, not just fleetingly or lackadaisically, but heart and soul, mind and strength. But how do we know that we're not just fooling ourselves or others? With no spiritual thermometer, it's hard to tell. In our Gospel today, Jesus offers us a barometer. To the Old Testament passage about loving God, he joins another text about loving neighbour. It's two commandments for the price of one. Like those TV ads, selling some super pillow or new tool with buy one, get one free. Difference is, there aren't really two commandments here at all. The second is a subclause or even a test of the first. If you love God, Certain things follow. 
in how you relate both to God and your fellows. If you really love God, you'll really love your neighbour, Jesus insists. Don't be calling me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do as I say, not going to love as I love. Anyone who says he loves God but hates his brother is a liar, says John. Like Aesop's farmer, if we say one thing but do another, we've only proven we can't be trusted. So like any good teacher, Jesus offers a principle and then explains it. What's the greatest commandment? Love God with your all, Jesus replies. And what does that look like? Well, loving me looks a lot like loving each other. Those who love God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength will do likewise to those created in God's image. They'll love one another as I have loved. Indeed, so completely does Christ identify with us in our need that he says, when I was hungry, thirsty or naked, you provided for me. A stranger, sick or in prison, you engaged with me. What you did for one of the least of these you did for me. It's not just that those who follow the first commandment will follow the second also. No, because loving God means loving him wherever we meet him, including in those around us. Then keeping the second commandment is keeping the first. As St Basil the Great put it, the good works we do out of love of neighbour, God accepts as acts of love of himself. He who has love for others and a desire for their good is united to God. But there's more. When Matthew tells today's story, Jesus' interlocutor is a prosecutor out to trick him. But in Mark's version that we heard, he's a fan and a genuine seeker. When Jesus answers the scribe, he repeats Jesus' words, savouring them as in Lexio Divina, and praising our Lord as the true teacher. So we have one answer, but two very different attitudes. One is genuinely looking for the truth, the other playing games. One is open to the word of God, the other fails to notice is in his very presence. Having good principles but acting badly is inconsistent, even deceptive. But so too are good actions with bad intentions. In his great encyclical, Veritatis Splendor, St John Paul said we can only judge an action from the perspective of the acting person. Let me give you an example. A doctor removes certain treatments from a dying patient and provides high doses of pain relief. Onlookers suspect he's engaging in euthanasia, truncating the patient's life to relieve his suffering. But if pressed for her reasons, the doctor might say, I wasn't trying to shorten anyone's life. I was giving my patient 
medically appropriate care. I removed ineffective treatments and over overly burdensome ones. I gave him the appropriate pain relief to keep him comfortable no more. I wouldn't dream of shortening someone's life, but I'll do everything reasonable to ensure what life they have is as comfortable and meaningful as possible. That's what I'm about. And Jesus might add, that's precisely what love commands. Of course, what we do on the outside, so to speak, by way of serving or abandoning others, should tell what we're really thinking. Otherwise, it's play-acting or hypocrisy. But it's also true that what or who we love internally will determine what we do and what it really means. We love God, as St John observes, because he loved us first. Having experienced that transforming love, we can act in God-loving, neighbour-loving ways. We learn to love, not just in a measured way, but with the boundlessness of Christ's love, giving ourselves heart and soul for others. The trustworthy person, according to Aesop, conforms their behaviour to their words. But the holy person, according to Jesus, so harmonises thoughts words and deeds, that their every work of mercy for others is also an act of worship of God, and their every act of divine service a work of mercy for others. <laughs>